Hi everyone, welcome. Good to see you all today. I'm here with uh, the Climate Interactive team and we're excited about what we're, uh, what we have in store for today's uh, session, about halfway through the training program. Um, as you're joining, why don't you all navigate to Poll Everywhere. Um, maybe someone could put it into the chat, the link. Um, and tell us your name and where you're from. Thanks, Tom from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, way to jump on it. We have James coming from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Tamara Ledley coming from Needham, Massachusetts. Tamara. Samir from Egypt. Alvin from Taiwan. Welcome everyone. I see some people coming into the chat too. Uh, we'll just get, we'll be using poll everywhere today. So why don't you uh, find your way to that, open up a separate tab or browser window and uh, um, we'll join and let's see who else we have joining here. Anna in Madrid and Stuart in San Antonio and Jazz in uh, the Philippines, David in Scotland, uh, Will in Oregon, Ian in the United Kingdom, Allison in the United Kingdom, Alva in Oakland, Larry in Jerusalem, Laura in Athens, Georgia, and the screen's filling up. Lori in Dallas, Texas, Megan, Chile. Uh, let's see who haven't. Jackie in Iowa, Thorsten from Bonn, Germany. I hope the flooding isn't too bad in Bonn. Definitely been hearing a lot about yeah. flooding there in Germany. Christine from Houston, Texas. Uh, Constanza from I missed it. Oh well. <laughs> uh, Luke from India, Lona from Germany, Sam from Tallahassee, Fabian from Amsterdam, Luis from Missouri. Great to see you all. Welcome. Uh, we'll give people just a minute to um, arrive and find their way to pull everywhere. Um, and I guess. Uh, while we'll, we're, we're doing that, why don't we just start with a big uh, hello. So um, we're going to unmute everyone's mi mics in just a second and um, say hello in the language of your choice, your favorite language, the language you like to speak in, whatever it may be. And we'll just unmute the mics for just a few seconds. Everyone say hello together. And then we'll close them Hello, out. Namaste. Three, two, one. Buenos dias. Hello. 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 Excellent. Uh, it's great to see you all. I see many uh, familiar faces too from uh, previous weeks and people who have already run lots and lots of En-ROADS events. So thanks for joining uh, and, and some new faces too. Um, if this is your first um, session, live session, you've been able to ma make it to, uh, welcome. And you can watch previous recordings uh, on the learning platform, learn.climateinteractive.org. So today um, we are going to be doing the Inroads Dynamics Quiz Show. We've tried to make it a little more fun, change it up a little bit. Uh, so get ready. We're going to be using Poll Everywhere to just uh, run through some different dynamics and talk about that. So that'll get started. Uh, we are Climate Interactive. We work closely with MIT. Along the way, if you have any questions, comments, offers, requests, feel free to write them into the chat. Um, or if you can, you can contact us by submitting a ticket um, by going to support.climateinteractive.org if you have any kind of long question of any sort, um, or you can directly email us at support at climateinteractive.org. Um, one of us on the team will, will try and field your response. Be patient. Sometimes it takes a couple of days, but we'll try and get back to you in time. Today, uh, we're going to be talking through the training, what's going on, uh, and then we'll do the quiz show. And then if uh, for those who have time after the top of the hour, um, if we have time even before the top of the hour, we will do a breakout room, uh, breakout room so people can connect, you can meet um, who else is here within this, uh, within this meeting. Uh, keep going. Um, so poll everywhere. Uh, many of you have already found your way to poll everywhere. We'll provide links in the chat um, for people who join late. 
And all right, next uh, slide. So just as a to give you a sense of what's coming up. So today we're doing this inroads dynamics quiz show that's reflecting on the la the module we released last week. All these different videos we had uh, talking about kind of the, these overarching dynamics. Next week, uh, our co-director, Dr. Elizabeth Sawin, will be joining us and talking about multi-solving and equity and how we can bring that into inroads experiences and also just about some of the um, some of the, the work that she's done around that. That's going to be a really excellent one. Don't miss that. Um, then two weeks from now on August 5th, um, we're actually actually carve out two hours if you can on your calendar. Um, we're going to play the climate action simulation game. So you all may have read about this. Um, this is kind of a more involved uh, way of running an inroads event. Um, it's a lot of fun and we want to give you all a chance to experience that if you're interested. Um, so two hours on August 5th for the climate action simulation. If you can't stay for two hours, join for as much time as you can. We're happy to have you. Um, so today, this morning, um, we released the multi-solving module uh, in anticipation of uh, next week's live session and just to continue providing you all content each week. So check that out. Learn climateinteractive.org is where you'll be able to access the new videos and quizzes um, all about multi-solving and equity and learn what this word multi-solving even means. It's probably new to many of you all. Um, so there's the link to the website. You can check that out. Um, great. Um, so the way this is going to work today, uh, well, oh, uh, so this um, many of you all, uh, we saw in the community space, the challenge that we had last week so uh, people were sharing inroads with their friends and colleagues, and uh, that was so awesome to see. If you haven't done that yet, or if you did it and you didn't share your picture, please share your pictures. We love to see them. They're so much fun. Uh, here's a couple examples, uh, someone sharing with their friends and uh, 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 someone they went to school with creating scenarios of possibility. And it sounded like from the from what I read over in the community space on learn.climateinteractive.org that there was some good insights that came out of that. And many people said it went better than they thought, which was great to hear. Um, all right, sorry, the sun is uh, coming in and you can't see my face very well, that's okay. Um, and so next week, uh, the challenge is, is around this topic of multi-solving. And um, so we encourage you to look to the news, find, Drew, one second, Drew, we can, Drew. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, uh, so next week, uh, we hope that you uh, will look to your news, find some examples of multi-solving, look to where you can identify different co-benefits in, uh, in out there in the world. And we can, you can read more about the challenge uh, on learn.climateinteractive.org. Um, all right, then the next slide. Um, so we are part way through, over, a little over halfway through um, the training so far. I hope you all have been enjoying um, it, it as we have gone through. If you missed any sections, feel free to go back and review them um, and check things out. Um, yeah. And then, great, next slide. So where this is all going, and I know some of you all have been following this and thinking about this, is that if at the end of this training program, if you run at least two events, um, you can become an Inroads Climate Ambassador. So already we have well over 300 Inroads Climate Ambassadors from all over the world. We hope to expand that. Um, I'm really excited to see many of you all and have many of you all become part of our uh, Inroads Climate Ambassador Network. Um, at the end of this training. Um, and one note along the way is, so we have tons of content in the training platform. So when you're there going through all the quizzes and the videos and all of that, you don't have to take every single thing. One, we're not checking behind you, um, but we do encourage you to, this is for your own uh, ability to learn. And so going through everything. So to become an Inroads Climate Ambassador, we're not gonna go into learn.climateinteractive.org and say, okay, did uh, so-and-so take every single last quiz? 
Um, so feel free to, but the really important thing is that you're using inroads to engage people um, and you're and you're excited to share it with others. And that's really what we're looking for uh, among inroads climate ambassadors. So, but participating in the training, uh, going through uh, the, the, the content that we have, uh, working your way through things um, is great. Then uh, we encourage you to check out two others leading the workshop or game. Some of you all may have the opportunity to do that live, or maybe you're just, uh, you just look at the recordings that we have. And we've already had that in our earlier part of the training, a list of lots of different recordings that people could check out. Then uh, do some practice session, do lead two events. These may not be that much of a practice session. You may be doing it uh, uh, for, for real, <laughs> presenting to people. Um, that's a key part of becoming an Inroads Climate Ambassador. Then getting feedback from participants and registering your events with us. Um, and once you do all that, you can submit your application to become an Inroads Climate Ambassador. You'll get a certificate from us and uh, we'll be happy to feature you on our website and you can join our network of other ambassadors. We have um, quarterly calls and we're figuring out all kinds of other ways to um, create, make sure this uh, community that, that uh, is getting built around Inroads uh, can continue to move forward and run with things. So that I think takes us up to where we are today. Uh, which is running uh, this quiz show. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the host of this quiz show, uh, Mr. Drew Jones, if he oh. is ready, and uh, we'll take it from here. All right. I'm trying to turn on my video. Is it working? All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the En-ROADS Dynamics Quiz Show the most fun that you can have while learning about the high order nonlinear differential equation model called En-ROADS that's determining and understanding the fate of the world. It's gonna be fun. We're gonna create a scenario, show it to you, and then you're gonna to try to guess which of the 10 main En-ROADS dynamics is best explain, best explains what's going on in the scenario. What facilitators have found is that 90% of questions about the dynamics are answered by these 10 stories about what's going on in the model. So this is a chance to think about, experiment with, and test your own knowledge of these 10. Now, some of you have watched the videos. Some of you have not watched the videos. So we thought we would spend just a few minutes catching everybody up regarding the video, excuse me, about these 10 dynamics. So I'm gonna go under here into Learn Worlds and get out of this full screen and go to um, actually into, yeah, I think it's in here in Learn Worlds. Let's go to the next. All right, so here we go, full screen. Wow, I look really ridiculous, look at that. Um, okay. Here are the 10 answers to 90% of the questions you're gonna get about dynamics in the model. Um, and they also are gonna be the answers to the questions that we lay out to you, to this scenario. So the first one you see when you play with the model, capital stock turnover. This is that idea that you'll notice that sometimes you're introducing a new technology new renewable energy or new energy efficiency or something, but it takes a long time for it to grow. Not like five years, but like 20 or 30 years because the old stuff is sitting there and it lasts 15 years or 30 years. It takes a long time to get the old stuff out. That is what we call capital stock turnover. So when you see a scenario and you see that dynamic in the quiz, click capital stock turnover, price demand feedback loop. When energy gets expensive, we use less of it. When energy gets cheap, we use more of it. That is this important feedback loop in the system. Watch for it, the price demand feedback loop. Crowding out, there's competition between all these different supplies. Competition between coal, oil, gas, renewables, all of them nuclear, new zero carbon. So when you get more of one, over the decades, you're gonna get less of the other. It crowds out other energy supplies. The opposite of crowding out is squeeze the balloon. 
if we have less of one of those things, we typically get more of another. Um, less of one thing, more of another. Less coal, perhaps more natural gas is one of the examples in the video. Economies of scale. The more you build of something, the cheaper it gets. The cheaper it gets, the more you build of something. This is this reinforcing virtuous feedback loop that is the engine of growth in energy transitions. Carbon bathtub. We like to think of the carbon cycle as this big bathtub of CO2 in the atmosphere. The collection, 400 parts per million, 400 parts per million in the co concentration in the atmosphere, governed by two things, inflows, what's going net emissions going into the bathtub and removals. And it's governed by those inflows and outflows. And it really, the dynamics are driven by that bathtub idea. That's the carbon bathtub. Watch the video for more. It's one of the answers of these 10 answers. Kaya, there's a really helpful view in the model. There's a helpful framing by this Japanese economist, Kaya, who said that population times GDP per capita, there's the growth of, pop of GDP, times the energy intensity, how much energy it takes per unit of, of GDP, times the carbon intensity. What is the fuel mix and how much carbon dioxide is emitted when you have uh, an exajoule of energy? Multiply those four things together. They're the four main drivers of energy emissions. That's a helpful framing. That is like number seven of the answers you're gonna, gonna wanna give. The multiple sliders paradox. I wonder if you've noted that when you move a slider, it doesn't always deliver the same results. It matters what you've done previously. That's really important. We call it the multiple sliders paradox. Urgency, the sooner you reduce emissions, the more temperature is affected. How soon we reduce emissions, like the 2020s, the 30s or the 40s matters a lot. There's also an answer of other. So maybe it's not one of those things. So the answer will be something else. Ellie, anyone on the team, did I say something backwards? Is there anything else that we should add before question number? Oh, wait, I got to say how the game works before I say question number one. Anything you would add? Ellie, Yazzie, Caroline, Janet, Clara? Uh, you missed uh, cascading causality. Oh, cascade, thank you. Phew. Cascading causality in the carbon cycle, climate, sea level rise system. It is wild if you notice it, but when emissions stay flat, concentrations goes up. Concentrations stay flat, temperature goes up. When temperature's flat, sea level rise still goes up. Now, some of these things only are happening for the next 50 or 70 years. They're in a transition to another mode where they will flatten out. However, that is what we mean by cascading causality. And it's gonna be a helpful idea as you explain what's going on in the model. Okay, scoring the game. Here's how it's gonna work. Get a piece of paper. Every time you're right, and note, sometimes there'll be nuances and send us a note. Maybe there'll be a second explanation as well. But if you think you're right, give yourself 10 points. Add up all of your answers and that's how you score yourself. If you're not into this whole thing and you think this whole, it's all goofy and you really just wanna to get to the facts, just play along. You don't need to keep score, just roll with us. We're being kind of silly today. Okay, anything else on the, on the scorekeeping or anything that anyone would add? No? All right, well, let's play. Okay, number one, here it comes. Number one, here's the scenario. In this scenario, look, what we've done is we've cranked up building and industry energy efficiency. You see that? And I'll click it again a few more times. Buildings, we're investing in insulation. We're investing in better motors and minimum standards for energy efficiency performance standards. Over time, what do we see? We see a change in over and overall energy demand. So that's happening. Here's energy demand and the effect of it. But I wanna draw your eyes to the year. Greenhouse gas emissions really drop in earnest out here in the 2030s. Energy consumption really falls significantly in the 2030s. Which of the 10 
best explain what is going on? Which of the 10 best explain? So I think, oh, 24 of you have already voted, great. So you're going into poll everywhere and you're gonna type in, pick one of these 10 as your choice. And let's see, we have, it shows how many, we have 47 answering. No, this is great, you're playing. Thank you for playing. 55 of you have answered the question. We're gonna give a little more time. This is the first one. Um, and we're gonna give a little more time for this one. And you're answering the question, which dynamic best explains what's going on? Folks on the team, when you think I should uh, show the responses, is it time? I can't see the numbers. Oh yeah, 78. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, one more time, will you just go back to uh, them and review your scenario one more yeah. real quick? Okay, so here it is. We have invested in energy efficiency. We, and that is the improvement rate of the energy intensity of new capital. New stuff that gets purchased is gonna be more and more efficient. The question is, why is it not till the 2030s that emissions go down? Which of these 10 dynamics best explains why? 87 of you have answered. This is great. You're showing up. All right. And so, Ellie, you ready? Can I go for it? Go for it. Okay. What did they say? Interesting. All right. We had people vote on almost all of them. And two thirds of you, 60% are correct. Ding, ding, ding. This is an example of the capital stock turnover. The reason it's delayed, there are other things going on in the system related to this policy, but the answer to why does it take so long? Because what we're doing is that we're improving the energy intensity of only the new stuff. So a new building gets built. Some retrofitting is happening in the model, but mostly it is new motors, new buildings and stuff. But we and the world is gonna be living with the old stuff as it gets retired away, but it lives on average about 15 years. That is motors and buildings and houses and commercial equipment and industry, all of that stuff slowly retires away. We bring in the new stuff that brings the energy use down, more energy efficiency. It brings consumption down. It means we need less coal, oil, and gas. And over time, that means that emissions go down. So the answer is capital stock turnover delay. So you would say to people, someone says, why did that take so long? Because it took us a long time to get the old stuff out and the new stuff in. Great. All right. So that was number one. Let's go. Ellie, anything more you would add before we go on to number two? Nope. Oh, let's keep rolling. All right. Number two. Number two. And here comes number two. It's about coal and renewables. So coal and renewables. Here's the scenario. What did we do? We just highly taxed coal in this scenario. And um, Yazzie, I think you could grab it out of Google and send people if they want to play with it while we talk. Uh, if you don't think that's helpful, you don't need to do it, but there it is. We're taxing coal. So watch, coal is more expensive. So instead of coal going up, it goes down a lot, less coal. And then someone says, hey, I was looking around, renewables went up. I thought we were just messing with coal. We're just over here on the fossil fuel industry. I didn't subsidize renewables. I didn't go to wind industry and say, here's some lower prices or solar. Why do renewables go up when coal goes down? Which of these 10 dynamics explain why, hold on a sec, and I'm gonna clear responses. Don't vote yet. Oh, and I'm not gonna show responses either, okay. Which of these 10 dynamics explains what's going on? Why is it, why is it that renewables goes up when coal goes down? Why is it that renewables goes up when coal goes down? Which of these dynamics is at play? Oh, wow, you're voting fast. 60 people have already uh, made your responses. 
60 people have already done it. And uh, let's, I can't see the numbers of how many, but uh, maybe someone else, if you have an intuition, LA, about when it's time to move on and show the responses when the numbers so try, come. Try moving your cursor off to the left side of your screen. There you go. Oh, thank you. A oh, hundred people, 95 have, have voted. All right, that, great. So you voted and here it comes. Squeeze the balloon, crowding out, price demand feedback loop for the votes. And the answer is D, squeeze the balloon. 52% of you guys got it. Yes, it is squeeze the balloon. Yet less of one thing, more of another. Less coal, there's still demand. People are looking for more energy. Where does that demand go? Well, it goes to lots of things. It's gonna be more nuclear, it's gonna be more natural gas, it's gonna be more wind and solar. So this is a dynamic of squeeze the balloon. And Janet, I tested this with you on our team and you said, hey, I thought that squeeze the balloon was like a bad thing. And the key thing with these dynamics, they're not good, they're not bad. They are just explanations of what's going on in the system. So a lot of you said price demand feedback loop and Clara, you had a guess around that. Uh, price demand feedback loop, this is gonna be around demand, not for, for a specific supply of energy, but this has to do with demand for energy overall, how much energy gets used overall and the price of energy. So the price demand feedback loop, all about energy use, not renewables or coal or which energy supply. Crowding out is related and many of you voted for that. We may get to that one later. All right, give yourself some points. Let's go on to number three. Number three, oh, that's a special question. Ding, ding, ding. Special question, here it comes. What's the special question? Which sort of creature is the host? See this guy? What is that? What kind of creature is that? Is it a Gila monster? Is it a Texas lizard? Is it a mud puppy? An alpine newt? A hellbender? Or an olm? And an olm is a real thing. A Congo eel. You are in the United States here. Texas is a big part of us. People think it, oh boy, you know what we have here? I think we have a feedback loop where people are seeing the votes coming for the Texas lizard. And that is making people's confidence that this is the answer increase, therefore those votes. This is what's called a reinforcing feedback loop, much like economies of scale, because everybody thinks it's the Texas lizard. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay. It is a hellbender. 6% of you got it. It is a hellbender. A hellbender is a endangered salamander that lives near us here in Asheville, where many of some of us live, and it loves clean water, and it is our mascot. And if you go to En-ROADS, and if you or go to our webpage, go to the Climate in Interactive webpage, and if you notice that you type in some address here, like that, that's wrong, you get a 404 page and who is sitting in the bathtub? That same hellbender, because the hellbender is our mascot. We love it. And uh, we hope that we are bending the world away from hell as well. Okay, number, huh, number four or five, carbon price and energy demand. And after this, we're gonna add, pause for some questions. But here comes another one. What dynamic explains this best? Okay. This is about carbon price and energy demand. Is that what I said? I wanna make sure I did it right. Carbon price and energy demand. Look over here at car, we did the carbon price, see that? We'll turn it on and off again. We crank up the energy price carbon price. And look at overall final energy consumption. How much energy is used on earth? It follows the blue line, not the black line. 
Overall, we have a carbon price. Carbon price is about coal, oil, and gas. Carbon price is about carbon. What the hell is going on here? Final energy consumption, people are using less energy. Someone raises their hand and say, what is going on here? Why is that happening? Which of, okay, don't vote yet. I gotta go over here and get this right. Don't vote yet. I need to, uh, not show responses, go to the previous, and I need to clear them. And okay, which dynamic explains why a carbon price brings energy consumption down? Why does a carbon price bring energy consumption down? Vote, 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 pick your answer. 56 of you have, what is going on? Which of the structural system dynamics is at play? Which is at play? Which is at play when we have carbon price up, energy demand down, you're voting, this is great. And I'm gonna show the responses. Well, I'll give you another minute. You're still, people are still coming in about a hundred. This is so great. We got like a hundred people playing this game. We never thought this was possible. We got like a hundred people voting. All right. So what are the responses? Wow, you nailed it. You guys are getting it. 85% of you nailed it. Exactly. This is the price demand feedback loop. This is the price demand feedback loop that says things that move energy costs down, you mean up, bring demand down. And of course, it works both ways. If we find things like, well, if we bring in and subsidize zero carbon energy, think about what that's going to do to overall uh, cost of energy. Cheap energy around the world, the same feedback loop says what happens, excuse me, what happens to energy demand? It goes up a little bit. You see that? So it works both ways. More expensive energy, demand down. Less expensive energy, demand goes up a little bit. That is the price demand balancing feedback loop. All right, good job with that one. You're, um, I'm gonna clear the responses. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna do this the other way around this time. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second. Ellie, Janet, and team, did you hear any questions so far that warrant pausing? I know we're halfway through the hour, but uh, I wanna get through the rest, but any people just stuck, like how does this game work? Or that explanation really, uh, they're still lost or should we move on to renewables and methane? I think, I think things are going well and um, yeah, we might have some questions we'll pick up at the end, but uh, keep, keep rolling. Cool, okay, renewables and methane. What I'm doing here is we are subsidizing renewables. We are saying we're gonna give tax rebates we're going to have departments of energy around the world investing in new renewables to make them cheaper and cheaper. And therefore, we're getting more growth in wind, more growth in solar. And now I'm going to go back and show it a few more times. Methane emissions goes down. Methane. Methane, which comes from as you know, landfills and cows and wastewater and agriculture and the oil and gas industry, like how the heck did encouraging renewable energy reduce methane? Which of these 10 explanations explains why the heck we have this going on? Or is that a bug in the model? Should we talk to Dr. Lori Siegel? Why is it, which of these answers Capital stock turnover, crowding out, Kaya, urgency, other, multiple sliders, cascading causality. So go ahead and vote. Which of these explains why it is that there would be this weird thing? Wind and solar reduces methane emissions? What the heck? And I see that the votes are coming in more slowly. Yeah, this is the hardest one. I gotta admit, this is the hardest one. Give yourself a break if it's not obvious. Uh, this is the hardest one. And we got two thirds of you have voted. And 76, all right, here they come. 
and I'm gonna show responses crowding out. Maybe when we get more of one thing, we get less of another. Crowding out or other, interesting. So, okay. I think you're right and I'm wrong on this one, everybody. Because I was gonna call it other. This was my trick question. This is my trick question. I thought the answer was other. So give yourself 10 points for other, but really you're right. And I missed this. Uh, it is an example of crowding out. Great point. More renewables. What happens to, uh, the answer is natural gas. Okay. It is an example of crowding out. More renewables, less natural gas. That is crowding out. Less natural gas less leakage of natural gas, which is essentially methane. Natural gas is just methane. So there's less leakage of it around the world. Therefore, um, methane emissions go down. You're right. It's an example of crowding out. Give yourself 10 points for crowding out. Give yourself 10 points for other, because that's what I thought we were aiming at. Isn't this a cool interdependency in two different parts of the system? People don't talk about wind and solar reducing these terrible methane emissions that are going on around the world. But when you go and look at them over here, overall methane, um, yeah, lower methane emissions, isn't that interesting? Okay, good job on that one. And I learned something, I appreciate that. We're gonna clear the responses. I'm not going to show you the responses and we're going to go on to the next one. And the next quiz question, new zero carbon energy. And here it comes. Okay, new zero carbon energy supply and renewables. Why is it? that we have more new zero carbon thorium fission or something. But the renewable industry, wind and solar goes way down. It doesn't follow the black line, but the blue line. Why is it that we have less wind and solar? And you can imagine, we've kind of assumed that we're gonna get this kind of growth in wind and solar. Why is it that the growth of this industry could mean less of that? So go over, what is your answer to this one? Uh, which dynamic explains why more new zero carbon energy means less uh, renewables? All this competition, more of one thing, less of another. Why is there this dynamic? And this is, a, I'm gonna show the responses. You're getting it exactly. This is crowding out, just like the last one. Um, this, the last one had more renewables, less gas. This one says more near zero carbon energy, less renewables, crowding out. 78% of you are getting that one. Excellent. Give yourself 10 points for that one. Okay, let's go on to the next question. And um, new zero carbon energy, coal and renewables. So this one is kind of interesting. And be patient with me on this one. And so what you would see here is let's look at coal and renewables. Here we go. If we encourage renewables, 0.2 degrees, right? What's happening? You have more renewable energy, you have less coal, you have less natural gas, burning of those, less emissions in the atmosphere, emissions go down, and the difference is 0.2 degrees. We were at 3.6, now 3.4, 0.2 degrees. However, let's now turn this off and, okay, 0.2 degrees is what we had before. Now I'm going to go and we're going to explore another one. We're going to say, well, I want to test renewables, but first um, I'm going to go and do this, the second scenario. And in the second scenario, what we're going to do is we're first, we're going to tax coal. So watch what I do here, tax coal, but now I wanna see what happens if we have renewables. 
It's going to give us 0.2 degrees, right? That's what it did last time. 0.2 degrees from renewables. Okay, here we go. Subsidized renewables. It went from 3.4 to 3.3. That's only 0.1. That's only 0.1. Why is it that the same slider has a different impact? It's just the slider. The slider is exactly the same. The subsidy to the industry is the same. Why wouldn't the impact be the same? It's the same model. Why is it that you get 0.2 on its own and you only get 0.1 after some coal policy? That's my question. So go here, vote what's going on, which dynamic explains this best. And this one, everybody, comes up so, so, so much. When we play the game, uh, people get confused by this a lot, this one. So this is a really important one to be able to explain and identify. Don't call it with people the multiple slit. That's what I'm calling it to you. People don't want to hear it that way. They'll want to hear this one as, oh, well, you took another action before. But 85 of you, great. Let's see the responses. Yes, 84% of you nailed it. It's the multiple sliders paradox. It is the fact that when you move multiple sliders or any slider and then do the same action, you're gonna get a different response. Why? In that case, well, coal already, excuse me, renewable, excuse me, I'm gonna say this more slowly. Why did it have this impact? Renewables reduces temperature by reducing coal. If you do something else to reduce coal, you won't be able to reduce coal quite as much. That is why. And that's the explanation you'll wanna give people. And what's dangerous about it as a facilitator is that you'll say you'll move a lot of things, they'll be disappointed. Oh, renewables don't do that much. The, the, the fix for it, what you do is if it's something that you really like and you say, oh, it only showed point 0.1, Go back to a blank screen and do it alone and show how much it does on its own. So people can then say, oh, it actually does bring us a full two tenths of a degree. That's how you handle it. Okay, multiple sliders paradox. You guys, boy, more and more are you getting this one. So concentrations and temperature. Let's go try this one. Concentrations and temperature. Concentration is flat. Wouldn't you think that if we could finally level concentrations at 459 parts per million and they're flat, wouldn't you think that the problem wouldn't get worse for another 80 years? Now it is growing more slowly. It is leveling out and it'll level out a century out. What explains this? Why is it that we seem to have finally gotten our handle on concentrations? PPM in the atmosphere, CO2 in the atmosphere is flattening. Why is it that temperature is still going up even under this scenario? What is going on? Uh, let's go, oh, I hope I reset everything. I didn't this time. Um, I'm gonna clear responses. Uh, and it's activated, go ahead. And what explains concentrations flat, temperature continuing up? What is going on? And there's a similar one with temperature flat, sea level going up. What is going on? That's a very unhelpful dynamic in the world. So what are you voting for? Show the responses, cascading causality. Exactly. Now, 38% of you are saying the carbon bathtub. The carbon bathtub really has about, about the drivers of concentration, not as much temperature. So it's close, it's close because the carbon bathtub is kind of part of this cascading causality story. It really shows up, you're gonna wanna give this explanation when people ask about the temperature 
sea level rise part of the system, they're going to want to understand some of these cascading dynamics. So good job with that one. Let's go to, um, I'm going to actually reset because this resetting is working really well. I'm going to clear the responses and we're going to do the next one. Here comes the next one. Um, concentrations and temperature and timing of carbon price. So here we are, we have a carbon price. And how much does it do? We have a carbon price here at $100 a ton, shaves off 0.7 degree. That is amazing. However, what if we start this in 2031? Wait, it only shaved off 0.6. What if we go in 2041? It only shaved off 0.5. What if we wait and in each of these years, you can notice what year does the fuel mix change really kick in? 2051, you get the idea. It's yet another less 0.2 degree of impact. Which is it? Go in here, which of them explain what's going on? Which of them explain what's going on here in the model? 41 of you have voted. This is great. 53, 55, okay. So which one is it? Absolutely. I, we called it urgency and en roads. It is the idea that the sooner we reduce emissions, the more of the impact on temperature. Some actions reduce emissions in the 2020s taxing coal, taxing natural gas, carbon pricing, a clean electricity standard, emissions go down, boom. Cutting utilization, keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground. Some things wait till the 2040s, new zero carbon. That 20 years matters a lot. We call that urgency in En-ROADS. We show that, call that urgency in En-ROADS. And now the last one, I'm just going to make this myself. The last one was actually the first one that we really got into. What if we could come up with policies that would flatten carbon emissions, CO2 emissions? What would happen to overall concentrations of CO2? I'm putting in a carbon price. I'm gonna have some energy efficiency, a little less energy efficiency, a little less. There we are, CO2 emissions are flat. Concentrations are going up. I'm going to show it a different way of what if emissions, see that red line, are flat. What if removals, this is what's getting pulled out of the atmosphere into plants, into oceans, of course, boosted by carbon removal if we did it. The emissions are flat. Removals are flat. We stopped polluting, basically. We stopped increasing our pollution. Why does the problem keep getting worse? Go vote which of the 10 dynamics best explains why the problem keeps getting worse. What is it about that story of emissions flat going in, removals flat going out? However, more is going in than is going out. That is why concentrations are going up. And I'm guessing you got it. Boom, the carbon bathtub, absolutely. If you've got double, look at this. If you've got double, look at the red line. Double the emissions going in then out. Double the emissions going into the bathtub, then coming out of the bathtub with the blue line. You see that? What I mean by that is right here, you've got double going in and is coming out. Of course that bathtub is increasing in its volume. Of course the concentration is going up. Until when? Well, it's not until you get those emissions down to the point, well, well let me, I'm not, I shouldn't do this with removals. You can, yeah, well you can get emissions down and removals up. And then in that beautiful moment, right there, 
they equal each other. And at that point, they're flat. Let me electrify a little bit, get these down. Okay, at this point right here in 2064, they're the same. If you have a bathtub, the same going in is going out. Concentrations are flat. That is the lesson of the bathtub. And it is also the reason why we should not be okay with just flattening emissions. That's why we're aiming for global net CO2, getting the emissions down to zero by around 2050. That's why China says net zero by 2060. That's why that red line's gotta come down, 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 down so much if we're gonna give ourselves a good chance to stay well below two degrees by adding in actions on methane and other. Okay, give yourself some points. And I think, did I do them all or did I skip one? L A N T. oh, actually you got that one. So we've already looked at it. I think that was all of them. Okay, so it is time for everybody to add up your points and you guys get to say how it went. I'm gonna look into the chat. The chat's a good way to do this or uh, no, why don't we have people, why don't we do it in here? Can we just do that? Any reason not to, Ellie Leah, let's just do that. We're just gonna say, and I should have thought this before, but here we are in our activities. We're just gonna say, and here's our mini training on Poll Everywhere. If you like Poll Everywhere, mini training, you ready? What you do is you just say open-ended and you say, points question mark create and here it comes i'm going to activate this type in your points how many points did you get i'm did curious to see me? oh yeah thank you uh share my screen and 90 80 all right <laughs> Wow, some people got eight answers right. 40, the hellbender one, that was, boy, that was tough. You thought it was a Texas lizard. 70, cool, you're getting it, you're getting it. And guess what? If you go watch the videos, you're really gonna get it because what we give you is five to 10 minutes on each of these where I'm not yelling at you with my sunglasses on. So in the actual training, what we're doing is we're slowing down a lot and explaining this. You can read it. You can watch more demos and a much slower, more methodical, respectful explanation of all of these dynamics. So the main thing coming out of this is go watch those videos, do the little quizzes. I hope this excited you about it. But I think the key thing, and this is now I'm taking my top, speaking to you as a facilitator, it is so helpful to have these 10 explanations in your pocket. Because as I said, 90% of the questions about why did the model do this will be one of these explanations. And you're not gonna say the words capital stock turnover or cascading causality in the carbon cycle and climate system. That's our internal language. You'll use plain language. <laughs> um, you'll use plain language that will say, why did that happen? Well, we had to get the old technology out to get the new in. That is what capital stock turnover is. They will nod and they'll get it. Somebody got everything but the hell vendor. All right. So I'm gonna pause for a second. This is great to see all you are here voting. Um, Ellie, anything you would add or questions or things that's coming up or Ellie would join me in acknowledging how well everybody did. Yeah. What, yeah, what's... great job, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for all the participation in the chat, Drew. There was a lot of discussion about what cascading causality was and just trying to get that, making sure that people really understood that one. Uh, some people kind of questioning, would it, is it like uh, inertia in the system? Like, could we also call it system inertia? Like, is that a, is a, that a good way to think about it? Um, so maybe yeah, if you want to go back on that one. You know, uh, even internally, Janet, you've been asking good questions about this one. I think I'm going to make another video because 
there's more to it. And when we teach this to climate science professionals with system dynamics, there are some helpful ways to look at it. I would say, whoever suggested inertia, if there was one word to explain this instead of cascading causality in the carbon cycle and climate, that's a good word, inertia. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest or in motion tend to stay at motion, but this is increasingly being driven. It's, it's, I'll make another video about it and we'll explain more. Watch the first video and then I think we should explain more. Others that came up, Ellie? Um, let's see. I saw one question, just what's the difference between crowding out and squeeze the balloon? Yeah, good point. Crowding out and squeeze the balloon are opposites of each other. They're opposites of the other. Crowding out is framed as we get a new thing, more nuclear power, therefore less renewables. Okay, that's crowding out. More of one thing, less of another. Squeeze the balloon is the other way around, but the same kind of dynamic. That, that would be less renewables, more nuclear. It's the same dynamic in the opposite direction. That's, and it, yeah, that's what it is. It's the same dynamic in the opposite direction. But you can think of them as the same kind of dynamic. The words matter less. Think of it overall as there's competition and your explanation about why things are going on between all those energy supplies usually is going to be competition and therefore either crowding, crowding out or squeeze the balloon. Other good questions that came up before we uh, wrap up? Uh, the other, the last thing I just saw in the chat was there was some discussion too about the name of the multiple sliders paradox yeah. and some people suggesting that maybe we should just call it multiplicative effects or nonlinear effects or something like that. I like multiplicative. Yeah. And, and note, some of these are pretty new and untested. So this is, it's helpful to get feedback about the names. Thank you. Yeah. Multiplicative. Uh, that sounds good. Yeah, definitely. All right, I think that's uh, that's it. Is well, there, I might have missed something in the chat, but um, yeah, that's what I have for well, now. The main message to everybody is here are all these videos. And in this section, it was released a week ago, but watch each of these. You'll notice each of them has their own notes that was pulled together about capital stock turnover, sometimes with a diagram like here. This is a really helpful stock and flow diagram that explains more about capital stock turnover. Or many of them, of course, have a quiz that will help you understand it better, like this quiz here for the price demand feedback loop. So check out those, but then move on to the multi-solving one, which is next. These are fascinating. This is groundbreaking work by Dr. Beth Sawin, our co-founder, our co-director. I hope you can watch those. And then the other would be, really, we really want to hear from you. Go to the community page, post your picture here of you running it, what you're learning, what you're seeing. And of course, go to the page when you sit down with your roommate, call that an En-ROADS workshop and register. If we're going to fund ourselves, we need to be able to tell the world and our funders how many people are actually doing this. And the only way we know if people are using these tools is if you go in and register your event, put your dot on that map. Anything, Ellie, before we shift over and we get people um, to go to breakout rooms to meet others in this amazing community? No, uh, we're about at the top of the hour. Um, so recognizing that some people only have an hour um, and might need to jump off. Um, but if you do have more, more time, uh, we'll switch over and, and we will do breakout two rooms. modes. We're going to stay here and answer more questions. So if you do want to stay, you can stay. Or Ellie, you were going to explain how the breakout rooms work. Yeah. Um, so we'll stick around and check out the chat uh, for more questions. Some of you that need to go to bed, good night. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Some of you all might need to go get coffee or breakfast if you're waking up early. Um, people coming from all over the world. But yeah, we're about to open up the breakout rooms and uh, 
then when you when the breakout rooms are open, you can click at the bottom of your screen. See where that red box on Drew's screen says one? Click on that and then you'll get a list of breakout rooms. And then when you hover over the number of how many people have joined in the breakout rooms, it will then say join. And you can join and just chat with people informally, talk about how you have used En-ROADS. Um, and Drew, what was the prompt you had? The prompt was, where have you shared En-ROADS in any way and how did it go? Or I played with it myself and here's how it went. Who did you share it with or just yourself? How did it go? Great. Uh, so why don't we open up the breakout rooms? All right, and so you can choice, choose to join or you can say not now and uh, stay in the main room and we'll keep chatting, your, your, your decision. And if you say not now, you can always join a breakout room at any point by clicking at the bottom where it says breakout rooms and then selecting which one you want to join. Um, and we will try and uh, make sure that all the breakout rooms have uh, some people in them talk about how people are using En-ROADS. So the rooms are, the rooms today are not, um, they're, they're just random. Uh, they're not kind of divided in any kind of cate categorized way. Um, so just join whichever one you want. Um, if you join one and you aren't interested in the conversation, feel free to leave, join another one, whatever it may be. Um, and then, but if you have questions and you're still here in the main room, uh, write them into the chat box and we'll pick them up. Um, uh, I know there was a we lot of a things lot. that they got through. I set, yeah. up a, I set up a poll everywhere if we wanted to uh, do it that way um, with the chance to, do we want to do it that way? Uh, with, with a poll everywhere for, for what? For questions with the, it has. Oh. Yeah, people could use poll everywhere or just write into the chat, whatever. Um, cool. So I'm putting it up. So if, um, yeah, and this is the one where you can vote them up if you want to have questions and More technical explanation of cascading causality. Um, as I said before, I'd love to give you that more fully uh, in a video, but if there's a lot of interest in that, I could show you my sketch. We could use this time to test it. I don't know, Janet, if you think the sketch is ready, but I sketched for you, Janet, a, uh, a really rough one. I'd love to go there if people are curious about it. I'll trust your judgment, Ellie, because I'm really would be nerding out a good bit. Uh, I, I don't even know what you're about to show. So. <laughs> Janet knows how bad it is. Uh, it's, I think it's fine to show. Yeah, it's a um, system diagram. I can, Drew, do you want me to send it to you again? I'm looking, uh, I think I have it. Yeah, I do. Um, I'm very excited. <laughs> Are you? Okay, well. Yes. <laughs> so um, if there really aren't other high votes, I guess I'll, we'll go for it. Um, am I showing my screen? No. Okay, everybody nerd alert. Hopefully if you're sticking around for more questions, you are the nerdiest nerds. Okay, you can handle it, you ready? So. Why is it that there's this cascading nature of emissions, concentrations, temperature, and even impacts like sea level rise? What is going on? You can think of it as inertia. I thought of it as cascading, but here's how one way to think about it, not the right way, but here is a way to think about it. And I'll make a better version of this at some point do you see the screen right now? Yeah, can you make it bigger? Yep. 
Um, Click uh, maybe the green dot on your upper left corner. Yeah. Okay. Go. So here's what's going on. And think of this as stocks and flows. So this is, see this as fossil energy use capacity. That is how many exajoules of coal, oil, and gas there is on earth. It is a bathtub. It is an accumulation. It is the overall capacity of the world to pump out, to use fossil fuels. It is increased and decreased by retiring. This is this whole dynamic of capital stock turnover is way down here, right? Every year you build, every year you retire. That capacity, how many exajoules, that drives an inflow of emissions to another bathtub. And that bathtub is the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That, so every year, this is flat. That means that is it a steady inflow into the bathtub, okay? Removals are coming out. We know that if emissions are above removals, this is flat, right? So imagine this is flat. This inflow is flat. If the inflow of emissions is flat, what do concentrations do? CO2 in the atmosphere does what? Actually, you should unmute. I need to talk to somebody. I'm way too extroverted to do this without hearing. Can we just unmute or people unmute and do this? Do we, have, we don't have too many people to unmute, do we? Uh, there's 20 people here. Okay, well, let's try. People, if you're willing to unmute and answer some of these questions, work with me here. Okay, so unmute. Emissions are flat. CO2 in the atmosphere does what? Goes up. It goes up. It goes Why? Up. Because of the bathtub. Because of that bathtub dynamic. But I'm also calling that this idea of cascading causality, that this is flat, so concentrations goes up. Okay, we got that? This is flat. By the way, it's the same here. You can have this in flat and the capacity goes up, but we're not going all the way back there. Emissions are flat, concentrations goes up. Okay, now imagine CO2 is flat. Think of this as the number of blankets around Earth is flat, okay? That is driving heat on Earth, leaving the system, okay? heat on earth. This is overall heat in earth, which drives the temperature. That is, leaves the system. It's like, this is what's, we are, have increased this. So by going from 270 parts per million to 400 parts per million, we have increased CO2 in the atmosphere. That has decreased this outflow of leaving. So this, this goes down. When it goes down, there are feedbacks in the system that lead it to re-equilibrate, but it takes like 60, 70 to 100 years, to 200 years. It is a long time for heat on earth to find the new equilibrium to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So during that, this 80 years that we've modeled, you'll see temperature continuing up as it seeks that new equilibrium with a new, a new rate of heat leaving. Now, think about heat on Earth being flat. Let's say we're able to level, level things at two degrees. That amount of heat drives two inflows to the volume of the ocean. It drives a steady increase to melting of land ice until the land ice is gone, but that takes hundreds of years. And it drives a steady increase to ocean thermal expansion. Warm water is bigger. And when there's heat, it is going to make that warm water bigger, which increases ocean volume. So that increase, that even when heat on earth is flat, then you have the those two inflows are going to be higher for a long time, at least through these 80 years. That is why we get flat temperature means that over here, overall sea level rise, to look at the last one, that even when 
temperature is flat, we get this and last one, I never got to demonstrate this, that sea level rise, even when we get temperature to be flat by doing basically everything, that is why even when this happens, we get sea level rise growing. So I summarize that as cascading causality, that there is this, you could call it, I don't know if it is inertia, I don't know inertia well enough, but this idea that one, one of these levels is flat, the next is increasing, when the next is increasing and so on down the chain to the point where it's just crazy to imagine that overall CO2 emissions could go down that much and still sea level rise goes up that much. It is because this causality seems to cascade. And this is a moment where I speak to you as uh, a fellow traveler in trying to make these concepts accessible to the kinds of people that you're gonna run into in your workshop. I would say I almost never have to go through that. In a real workshop, people just accept this or they don't ask. However, that's my best explanation about some of the underlying dynamics in a way that'll fit within about five minutes. So, hadn't prepped for that one, but uh, any, it, any, I, Janet is still looking at the ceiling. Janet has been my best inquisitor about this dynamic. Janet, does it make it, do you understand at least what I'm trying to say? Sort of. Um, <laughs> okay. I mean, I, 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 I should say yes, but. No, you, you shouldn't. Like, you got it. So, <laughs> no, I know you like questions, but yeah. So, any when other one level, when one level is flat, another is increasing because of the delay. That's the reason it's increasing. And the delay is because of the structure of the system that it, it takes a long that feedback structure and the stock and flow structure takes a long time to re equilibrate. So, the feedbacks that kick in. It takes a long time. So the, it is because of the delays, but the source of the delays is actually the stock and flow structure. Mm -hmm. Other, yeah. so there's the first question. And yeah, go ahead. Go back to your diagram. Can you put that back on the screen? Yeah, hold on. So the CO2 in the atmosphere, you were talking about if the input, if the emissions are flat, then the CO2 in the atmosphere goes up. Yeah. But that's only part of the picture because that happens, I think that happens because the removals are either, well, the removals have to be, well, I guess either flat or decreasing in order for the- Which they are, yeah. Okay, but you, so you can't just, you have to, that has to be clarified. See, I got sort of lost at that point because I'm saying, wait a second, if the, if the emissions are flat, how can the CO2 in the atmosphere increase when we haven't even talked about the removals? Yeah, yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, there are many other assumptions that you need to address to tell the whole picture. Um, I think I offer this idea of cascading causality as like, what is an explanation that you can offer somebody as to why, well, you saw that dynamic of emissions down, sea level rise up, and it does cascade. Um, there are many other factors that are going on. So maybe we should just say, we should explain it more. And maybe here we are, 15 past. Should we do another question and note that this is one, boy, people are curious about. Um, I'm gonna go back here. Oh, it was the only one written in here. Are there other in chat that you saw, Ellie or Yazzie or Caroline or Janet that we should address? Could I quickly, could I quickly comment on this if this is this possible your explanation? Because I think that uh, it, it was very good. I liked it. Uh, so it, it was yeah, go ahead. Yeah, clearer than in the, in the in the current uh, module, 
but I think there's an asymmetry here because you mentioned emissions being flat, but that increases the CO2 uh, in the atmosphere, right? Because you continue emitting. So, so it, they have to go to zero basically. So yeah. that CO2 stabilizes, but that is a different um, uh, dynamic from what you explained with the other ones. Because the other ones then you said, oh, it equi equilibrates, right? We stop temperature increase, then we're in a long transient, right. then we have sea level rise. It's which not is the same dynamic at each step along the way. Well said, Fabian. And Janet, you were saying the same thing. It's not exactly the same dynamic along the way. You're right. Yeah, so I think there are yeah. two, two, two parts of the explanation, right? One is just the causal chain, you know, going from A to B to C to D. And then the other one is really this inertia, these long transients. Um, each, yeah. each of the four have totally different dynamics. Yeah. I wonder if I'm over trying to oversimplify it to give a short answer, but thank you, Fabian. That was a good point to make. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, yeah, the first one's a different dynamic because if you keep the emissions flat, the concentration will increase forever. There's no equilibration. If... Assuming removals yeah. <laughs> don't, don't take over, I understand that. Yeah. But the others all equilibrate. So basically one of them is linear and the others are not. The, the last three are not. And I'm one, But I'm wondering if I were talking to somebody about this as a workshop facilitator, am I ever going to talk about all four of them in a row anyway? Or do I just need to understand each one individually? And that might make it a lot easier and rather than trying to wrap them all into one Interesting. Thing. Yeah, that could be it of just to do each one. I would try to generalize a general feel because you get so few questions in that part of the model. Nobody asks, frankly, but I wanted to give something to say what's going on there. But yeah, maybe they should be done one by one. And one note about equilibrating the, the heat balance of earth, it doesn't necessarily equilibrate. People want to spray sulfate, spray sulfate aerosols in the stratosphere. So it wouldn't. So each of them has their own <laughs> twist. Maybe each one needs to be handled separately. Cool. Wow, this is fun. You guys are our colleagues now. I love it. This is the dream. Jack's got his finger up. Are we going to go there? Or is there someone hungry to say something else? Yeah, Jack, what do you got? Oh, well, and just before you go, uh, we'll wrap up the breakout rooms. They're also booming and lots of good discussions over okay. there. And so we'll give them a two minute warning. So Jack, you had your hand up in a droop. Just a, it's just a, a, a thought, and that is when you're trying to explain this to people who are not into climate science, the, the most recognizable effect that they see is emissions and heat. And you know, and we all recognize that things result from increasing temperatures. The ice melts on the caps. You were so all of these things happen. And I'm, it's almost like not being able to see the front of the trees. If you go into a lot of detail about the mechanisms of each one of those steps, you sort of lose the picture where you began, which is the issue that people are facing at this point in time and are most familiar with. Yeah. So I think having, having a resource, having maybe another video or something that really goes into that so that we understand it better is more important than trying to figure out how to convert our understanding at this point of the intricacies of the full-on steps and risk confusing the whole picture. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, Jack. A droop and then Barbara and then let's uh, move on. Yeah, a droop, go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi. So I, I'm just really trying to think this through from a core physics, like maybe commonsensical perspective is, so you got CO2 molecules going into the atmosphere and then they diffuse out. I mean, it's along the lines of what Jack was saying, right? So that, that takes a few decades to diffuse because there's so much atmosphere around us and that changes the heating property of the air and makes it more like a blanket. And that over time, brings up the steady state temperature of the atmosphere higher and that melts sea ice or causes whatever with the world oceans and so each step along the way has got like maybe a 10 to 20 year lag and that's basically what it is it's, it's the scale of the physics with relation to the, the volume of the co2 that's getting 
emitted annually. I know it's a bit too maybe engineering and scientific, but do we really need to step away from that and sort of simplify it to the level of talking about water flows? Um, does that make it more confusing by doing that? So maybe the framing of, of just lags, um, it's a question of, of how we want to simplify. There, as you can see, there are a lot of dynamics that aren't just about delays, but about the relative right. inflows and outflows. The lags are created by the stocks, the slow building and the slow mm -hmm. receding of them. So that could be a way to do it. And maybe some people just need to hear it as delays because that is definitely a component. So maybe lags could be a way to do it. We're all experimenting right now with how we talk about these things. And I have to say, I'm drawn to what we're saying with Jack of just, I mean, when I say, I say climate science is easy. Greenhouse gas emissions go in the atmosphere. It's pollution. We need to get rid of them. <laughs> like it's, you don't need to explain a lot more than that. But uh, if you're going to, these are some ways to talk about it, either as cascading causality or each of them on their own or maybe with lags. But Barbara, maybe you get the last word on this point. Yeah. Okay, I hope I'm not muted. Um, we can I, hear you fine. It, it's a different point. This is about natural gas and leakage. Great. And I, as an individual consumer, I'm converting everything in my house to electric, but I've still got all that infrastructure coming to my house. All of it can still leak. So I think that, it re that my action doesn't really make any difference. What makes a difference is when the infrastructure, like new housing is built with no gas infrastructure, that that's where you get the savings. But I don't see how simply cutting back on usage changes anything if you don't change the infrastructure. Yeah. It, 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 it makes a difference, um, Barbara, because you um, it's related to pressure, first of all. Leakage is related to pressure. And if the demand is down, there's less drilling. And much of the linkage in the natural gas system is due to, to drilling and fracking and production. So if you cut demand, you will reduce leakage. If you reduce demand, you reduce pressure in the system and you reduce leakage. So you don't have the same system. Ron Edelstein, that made a lot of sense. Thank you. Well, the part about the fracking does, but I don't, I don't think they're going to reduce the pressure in the system. They're going to keep the system pressurized. They'll keep it pressured. Yeah, they'll keep it pressured. The, the, the way I think about it is like, we're think, thinking about the entire world here. So if we have less natural gas demand, then there are parts of the system that are just not, they're not getting new, new natural gas infrastructure is not getting built and things are not getting used. So you have from the fracking to the pipeline, the compressor stations, and all of those lines that go out to people's houses, to the uh, large storage areas, some of that won't be used. Uh, it won't be utilized in the same way. And so that's where kind of trying to scale from like, okay, the, the own household experience on up to the globe, uh, we can think about it that way too. But that's a, that's a great question, Barbara. Thank All right, last, I think so uh, we have closed out the breakout room. So welcome back everyone who was in a breakout room. I hope those conversations were helpful. You guys got to share some um, experiences. Uh, Drew, you want to have the last word and we'll wrap it up for today. There's so many reasons for you all to take En-ROADS and go out and engage others, first by practicing, but by aiming high and saying, whom can I influence to direct the world at the highest leverage actions to address climate? We saw what's been happening in Aust Austria, some in China, the Pacific Northwest here in the US, so many important reasons to build your capacity to engage people in a different way. Take En-ROADS, watch the videos, start taking it to people and having conversations with them and aim high for whom you wanna to influence to take aggressive action to address this challenge. Register your events, let us know how it goes, but overall use to make a big difference. Go get them, you guys. We love you and we believe in you. Thanks everyone, take care, have a good evening or good morning, good day, wherever you are out there in the world. Good to see you all.